do you define as fornication? So it's actually interesting that you asked that question because the what we translate as fornication and sexual immorality in English today in the New Testament, in the original Greek was the word pornia, where we get porn, pornography, right? All forms of fornication have always been understood as when you take the gift of sexuality and you express it outside of the parameters that are holy and righteous as defined by God in marriage. So when you understand it in that sense, it then brings us back to that point that Abuna was hammering in. You are, you are self-destructing when you expose yourself to pornography. And there's another aspect to this that I want to add to what, uh, what Father was saying, is that you got to remember when you're, when you're contributing to an industry that is holding so many men and women in slavery, your viewership, your participation in this, is endorsing the sin of others. And when you objectify a man or a woman, you are completely acting without integrity towards the dignity that that person has when they bear the image and likeness of God. Mm. You are completely forgetting that that girl that you are staring at is a daughter of Christ, yeah. one that he died for. He shed his blood for her. And she is in sinful bondage in the industry that she is in. And yet here I am entertaining myself acting like I'm not contributing to that, to that marketplace that is holding her into slavery. And now we haven't even gotten into the disaster of what is human trafficking and how there is such a huge population of young women and young men who are part of this industry that are there completely outside of their free will. It, it, is, it would be absolutely foolish to suggest that no one is being harmed. Abuna has done a wonderful job in explaining how you're self-destructing and destroying your soul let alone how it is that you're contributing to the destruction of so many people's lives in the process. Okay, so take w one person by themselves in pornography out of the equation. Take, you know, the, the harm to someone else that you don't know but is part of an industry. How about two people not married but they love each other or they're engaged or they've promised each other to each other? Them in that love engaging in sexuality, sexual intercourse. What is the problem there? Good question. We have always understood the gift of human sexuality fully expressed in sexual activity as something within the confines of the commitment between a husband and a wife. And this goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. That when God creates Adam and Eve, he talks about how it is that Adam is called to take for himself this woman and make her his wife. So he says, for this reason, and this is interesting because even Christ himself in the gospel refers back to this. So this is no longer just something we could say, oh, that was Old Testament. No, Christ himself quotes this passage. He says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two of them will become one flesh. When God puts the parameters, of them becoming one flesh. And by the way, this one flesh is not only symbolic and spiritual, it's meant to also be understood literally. They become one in the process of this holy and sacred sexual intimacy. When they become one, it is in this committed relationship, this covenant that exists between them as man and wife. When sex is taken outside of that, and it becomes nothing more than something casual, and it becomes something where there is no commitment. We're free to leave each other tomorrow morning if we don't like each other. If we grow out of love from each other, and there is only this committed thing where we just promise to each other until we feel like it, until we change our minds. But th this is not the, 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 the very parameters that God has put in place when it comes to a husband and wife. As a matter of fact, Scripture is so clear on this that when St. Paul the Apostle wants to give us the very image of the importance of this committed relationship, what is the image he gives us? Christ and his bride, the church. And what did this husband, this bridegroom, offer to his wife in this committed covenantal relationship? His very own life. There was, this, there was no such thing as, if I don't feel like it anymore, we can change our minds. There is sincere and real covenant. Sex outside of that covenant goes back to what Abuna was describing perfectly. Father, if you paid attention to what he was saying, he was saying something very important. He was saying love is truly expressed when you offer 
Lust is when you take. In this committed relationship, you find the person that you say, I want to offer myself to. Not that I want to abuse and use for the sake of my own gratification and lust. And if I can add to that, <laughs> I'm going to go back to my example or about talking about the Trinity, right? So, so again, we all, marriage is a mirror of the Holy Trinity and it's like Christ, the bridegroom, and the church, the bride. They're, they're both there and they're both mysteries. And that's why marriage is a sacrament because you are united. So the three persons of the Trinity are united in one through love, right? And for us to be able to love like they love, we also are united. So mm. if I don't get to the point that there is this blessing and this covenantal love between us, then we are not united yet. So I can say, and if I'm not united, that means it's love done outside of God. So it's a fallen type of love. So I can say I love her as much as I want to love her, right? And I can say this and I can scream this. However, this love is not done in God yet. It's still outside of God and therefore it is still sin according to God's understanding. 